It's great to be here to be able to speak about optometry. So uh, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, uh, I know that you've got various opportunities with panels and workshops and the rest of the day. So hopefully today you'll find out everything you need to know about optometry. So I guess the first question to ask is why optometry? Um, and, and what is an optometrist? And what do optometrists do? So optometrists are independent primary health care providers. Uh, they examine, diagnose, treat, and manage diseases and disorders of the visual system, the eye, and its associated structures. Uh, they identify related systemic conditions and are an integrated part of the healthcare team, prescribe glasses and contact lenses, rehabilitate those with low vision who are visually impaired, diagnose and treat ocular disease. To be a doctor of optometry or an OD, you need a, a baccalaureate degree uh, from an accredited university or college. You need to have completed a four-year program at a school or college of optometry. As a student, you'll complete your national board exams uh, in optometry. Um, and then upon graduation, um, you'll need to apply for licensure in the state that you, uh, that you uh, wish to work. On graduating, you can either go straight into practice or um, increasingly now there's residency programs available, usually a one-year residency. Uh, and we're particularly proud at Berkeley, over half of our graduating class last year uh, did residencies, so went into the residency programs. So there's roughly 33,000 optometrists now practicing in about 7,000 communities. Over half of those communities, they're the only eye doctor available. Um, and around 70% of all uh, eye care examinations are performed or delivered by optometrists within the United States. So how are things changing for optometry? Optometry has changed a fair amount over the last 10, 20 years with expanded scope of practice and becoming a truly primary care profession. But, you know, the for primary care clinicians, the future is, is looking very good. There's going to be lots of demand. And this is really why the increase in population. Uh, if you look at the over 45s between uh, the year 2000 and what's estimated in 2020, we increased from 34% of the population to 41% of the population. So that's going from 98 million to nearly 140 million. So over 40 million more people in the uh, 45 and above age group. And why does that matter? In that most of our, most, most of the uh, eye problems really start after the age of 45 in terms of uh, um, things like reading glasses. 45 is the age where everybody, even if your eyes have been normal to that point, requires reading glasses. And a lot of problems like diabetes, macular degeneration, glaucoma, that affect the eye um, usually start after this age. Obviously, there's a lot of childhood problems that we deal with too, but really this is the population that, that can drive the demand. Um, so there's certainly going to be a growing demand in, uh, for the services of optometrists. It's estimated over 200,000 Americans will develop macular degeneration or develop macular degeneration at present. That expected to double by 2020. Um, one in six people with cataracts over the age of 40, and that'll give us 30 million eventually as that expands uh, by the year 2020. Growth in obesity that's linked to diabetes, and one of the main complications of, diabetic eye uh, of diabetes is diabetic eye disease. Uh, and so that's estimated to uh, almost double uh, um, if we compare 2004 figures to 2020 at 7.1 or 7.2 million. Uh, glaucoma, the area that I have a particular interest, um, we uh, responsible for around 7 million eye visits uh, a year, and that's estimated to jump to 10 million by 2020. And you can see the pattern continuing here in terms of things like low vision and blindness and the demand for those services increasing 67% as we go from 2004 to 2020. So there's uh, a lot of demand, uh, or pent up demand in, uh, as our, the demographics of our country changes and we get older. You'll see in terms of uh, the um, 
role for disease management and how that's changing over time. Um, you, he, what you're looking at in the graph here is the increase in the number of scripts written um, uh, in, uh, by optometrists uh, over a period of time between 2004 and 2010. These numbers lag behind a little bit, um, but uh, you can see that almost exponential increase in the... Uh, um, oh. Right, a uh, huge increase again in, in the number of scripts being written. It's estimated that optometry will keep on increasing numbers. We're uh, estimated that there'll be 36,000 by 2016, um, but that that actually may be short of what may be required with the increasing uh, and aging population. What's interesting though is the changes in model in medicine. Uh, and uh, residency and fellowship training within ophthalmology. That um, the rate at the moment for retirements within ophthalmology is 600 ret retiring ophthalmologists a year, um, but there's only 450 residency places. So in actual fact, op ophthalmology is reducing numbers and becoming more of a specialty training. So uh, in the, the era, if you like, of general ophthalmology is reducing, that most ophthalmologists training now are specialists, either retina or glaucoma or anterior segment. And that, uh, that changes the, uh, the sort of practice uh, demands and, and style and management um, and, and creating this vacuum that optometry is now there to fill. So, um, and here we see the uh, expected number of ophthalmologists over time uh, and the estimate uh, of required ophthalmologists. So optometry is really filling in that gap as we move forward. So we know that vision care will be more accessible as we move forward, um, maybe more affordable. Scope of practice of, of optometry will uh, continue to broaden somewhat, uh, particularly in that primary care role. The number of ophthalmologists is decreasing number of optometrists will increase slightly, um, and we hope that you'll be one of those. Uh, in terms of Berkeley, um, you can get in touch with us through the Admissions and Student Affairs Office, and we have uh, Associate Dean um, Van Sleiters with us who will be uh, helping out with some of the workshops, so uh, please make sure that you, uh, uh, that you get the contact information, and we have some of our students here today uh, to help with those workshops too. In terms of uh, uh, Berkeley Optometry's place within uh, the UC system, here you see the promotional material in terms of the uh, UC Health professional schools and programs, uh, and we're always quite proud to say we're right there in the middle um, as uh, optometry proudly taking our place amongst the uh, health science programs in, uh, in the, within the uh, UC system. And if you look at the promotional materials um, around UC Health, uh, we feature quite prominently here. It talks about the over 100,000 patients that we see uh, a year. And you can see the, I don't know what it is, but whenever people want to promote optometry, they always use these old, um, old, old uh, phoropters, as we call them, with the, the lenses. I guess it's just something that I, everyone can identify with optometry. Um, but uh, uh, we're having troubles with this. HDMI connection. That's the second time it's gone out. Well, is it see. the other end? Probably just. Okay. That's. How many slides did you have left? Yeah, there's quite a few. Oh my goodness. I actually have no idea why it's. Wait. Should we try the other? Actually, just turned off. Mm -hmm. Did the projector just? It looks like it's off. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps somebody next door is turning them off. <laughs> 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 well, look, I'll, I'll 
I'll just keep talking because you know you've got tight, uh, tight schedules while they're trying to, to fix this. Um, what I was planning to show you was that you know, we're prominent within the promotion of the health sciences, uh, both in terms of uh, community impact and, and health innovations. Um, in terms of our new intake of students, just to give you a bit of a background as to what happens at Berkeley, last year we had uh, 256 applicants. We gave 114 interviews, 82 people were offered places, three people were waitlisted, two of those were admitted. So we ended up with a class, our normal class size of 65 for our class of 2018. Their GPA was uh, 3.4, their average GPA, and their um, OAT was 349. Now, we, I, I, one of the things we boast about, of course, is that um, we always are the top in terms of those numbers, and you could argue we're the toughest school to get into, but don't let that stop you applying, please. Um, we know we get a lot of people self-selecting not to apply at Berkeley because we're the toughest to get into, but you'd be surprised. You don't um, to have, okay, great, thank you. To have an average, it doesn't mean that everybody's quite at that level, so. Um, you know, remember that uh, um, you know you can you can it can get into uh, into Berkeley. Um, so of our uh, 65, 56 came from California, uh, eight were out of state, um, and you see the states there. And there's uh, one international student from Canada, and that was to help join me as the new Canadian uh, in the school to keep me company. So. Um, here's the breakdown of last year, 10 from UCB, 11 from Davis, 11 from UCLA, 4 from Irvine, 2 from Riverside, um, 6 from San Diego, and then the list there is the uh, other universities for the uh, uh, out-of-state people. Um, I think that's a little low for Berkeley's usually a little higher perhaps, uh, and, and Davis, there you go, uh, 11. Um, the highest joint with UCLA. But obviously most of the students come from our, uh, uh, from the UC system or, or from the state of California at least. In terms of our diversity profile, you can uh, have a look up there. Um, we're a pretty diverse group. Um, we're, uh, ha uh, the, there's certainly more women than men in, the, uh, uh, in, in our classes, um, but uh, Hopefully you can identify your, uh, uh, your favorite group up there in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so remember that being at, uh, being at Berkeley Optometry or any of the optometry schools can be very different from being an undergraduate. Um, there's not as much competition for grades. That's always one we boast about. It's sometimes more difficult to do because most of you, to get into optometry, you have it ingrained, this competition in you. So we try, like most of the health science programs, to make that a more collaborative uh, approach once you get into the program. Um, so grades aren't belled. Um, you know, if everyone does well in a class, they can all get A's. Um, the, if you achieve a, a class average, you'll get a final grade of a B plus or an A minus. And it is very unusual once you're in for people not to graduate. It does happen occasionally. Um, you all go through the same schedule and you're highly scheduled. Again, just like any of the professional schools. Um, and every course is required. You don't have many choices. Um, again, much more emphasis on student-driven learning. Um, and, and collaborative study is, is a requirement. There are plenty of classes where you, you have to work in a collaborative way. In terms of Berkeley, again, what are our advantages? Well, one, obviously, is the campus. Um, being a newbie there myself, I mean, it's an absolutely beautiful place to be. Of course, academically, um, you know, I, I think it's well known that Berkeley is one of the top universities in the world. Uh, and again, this year, we were voted the, the top um, public university in, in, in North America. Um, so we're very proud of those traditions. And tradition is another uh, important aspect of Berkeley. We're just celebrating the 50th anniversary this month of the uh, 
uh, free speech movement. There have been all sorts of things around campus um, looking at, uh, looking at that uh, and celebrating that. So there's a tremendous history, there's a tremendous culture of arts and sports, go bears. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we're very proud of the culture that, that it brings. Um, we feel we have a very, very fair uh, interview process. Everybody's interviewed on the same day. We now use MMIs as part of that interview process. Um, you'll get to meet other students and, and staff um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty standardized um, process that a lot of time and energy has gone into uh, uh, making it a fair and uh, equitable process. You know, we do boast the best students. Um, they're from diverse backgrounds, have diverse interests and skills. The number one reason for applying uh, for our Berkeley students is that they want to help people. Uh, our class size is usually around 65, 66. Uh, we have a pretty active student government. Uh, we boast the highest uh, pass rates on the national boards, so we prepare you well. Uh, and we do have uh, um, quite a lot of financial aid and support as you're going through. Anyone who wants to look at the national board uh, results, we keep those on the website and keep track of those. Um, you can also see those in... Uh, um, uh, at the um, uh, Association of Schools and Colleges uh, of Optometry website. Um, one of the other things that we boast about really is that um, prerequisites prepare you so that when you come to your first year classes, it's all about vision and optometry. And we get you into the clinic very, very quickly uh, within your first year. So it's only vision science and optometry courses. Um, we have one of the lowest student faculty ratios at around four to one. In fact, it ties the lowest, this is the table. Um, you can see we're second only to Oklahoma, there's 3.8. So we're both effectively four in our uh, staff ratio. Surprises people given our research reputation that that's the case. Um, we will also offer you the most clinical experience. Um, we have a massive clinical operation that we now believe is the, is the largest in all optometry. Um, with, uh, if we look at the breakdown here, over 130,000 patients uh, through our system, uh, 80,000 in our main clinic uh, on campus, and a further 7,500 at the uh, Tang Center, which is the student health center at Berkeley. So we have over 87,000 patient visits a year actually on campus. Um, so uh, the, there's, there's uh, you know, you often hear about our research. You don't necessarily always hear that we're also the busiest and best clinical program, hence so many of our students going into residency. Um, we also are proud of our research. Um, we bring in the most dollars of any university for uh, research in vision sciences, um, and, and that's something we're very proud of. So we have one of the longest running um, uh, National Institutes of Health programs for um, vision science, uh, and we uh, have around 38 PhD students in our graduate program as well as all the optometry students. So it's the place where you actually hear the professors who did the work rather than hearing about the professors, and again, we're, uh, and their work, we're very proud of, of that aspect too. So that really tells you about optometry, a little bit about our program, and uh, we may or may not have time, but if there's any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them, um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the workshops later on in the day, and make sure you get all your answers, um, your questions answered. So. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have time for questions now, or do you need to move on the program? Okay, any questions now? No? Yeah, I'm gonna hand that one over to my uh, associate dean of uh, student affairs, because he can thank answer you. that better than I can. So your question was, when is the deadline for applications yeah. for biases? Um, 
Uh, as the dean mentioned, we're the only school that uh, does not do rolling admissions. So we consider all applicants in one population, and we close applications, collect all the applications, review them, select the people to be interviewed, and then interview everybody at the same time. Um, we think that's a fairer process. Um, rolling admissions suffer from the problem of always being worried about who's going to apply next, uh, both from a student standpoint and also from a school standpoint. Um, we see the entire population of people who are possible to admit before we make a single decision. Um, and that makes the, uh, the application period um, truncated. It has to stop so that we can make that consideration. But we run it until December 1st, starting in July. And that should give everybody who's interested in going the next fall ample time to put their application together. There is absolutely no advantage to applying early in a system where there's not rolling admissions. So you make your application at the very best time for you rather than trying to game the system to get it in as soon as possible because you have a better chance of being admitted. Thank you. I knew you'd answer that question better than I could. <laughs> okay, no more questions. Well, we'll just be around the back for a few minutes if, if uh, if there's anything you uh, want to ask and we're too frightened to yell out loud. Oh, we've got one more over here. Again, I, 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 don't, I don't believe so, but uh, Rick, do you want to just confirm that for me? Or? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you at the workshops. Okay.